spiritually speaking, um, what's happening right now in the world, I believe, uh, through COVID-19, is a sign to us. A sign is always signaling what's to come or what's coming. Events such as this are supposed to wake us up, especially uh, those that are asleep or, uh, you know, uh, kind of slumbering spiritually. But God's showing the church right now, and I believe he's showing us that we're really not ready. We're not ready for, for what he has for us next. Uh, we're not ready, I think, for the second coming of Christ even. Um, he's going to return, by the way. And I know we don't talk about it that much in church anymore, and they used to preach about it probably back in the 70s and 80s a lot, but Jesus is going to return. He is going to return, and you need to hear that said from my own mouth, and you need to be ready for when he, rec- for when he comes. Um, just like the pandemic, I think about how quickly everything changed in our lives with the pandemic. It's just like overnight, out of nowhere, it seemed like it hit America, and so will the Son of Man appear then we need to be ready. And as the church, we need to be ready for the harvest, for even what God wants to do coming out of this. I don't know when, you know, all this is going to return to to some sense of of normal, but God wants us to be ready for what he did during this time. And I'm convinced God was working in people's lives during this time, maybe them waking them up and making them realize, you know what, I need to get back to church. And maybe you're watching right now, and you've had that thought over the past few weeks, you know what? We need to get our family back in church. That's a God thought. So we're in a time of unique opportunity to mature spiritually. And I really believe that that is the sign and God is showing us that we need that. I believe that God's preparing you for what he has for you next. And you need to get back in and into what God's doing. And whatever he does or gives will be a gift. A gift to you, for you to serve others and love others. If we recognize the time that we are in, I really believe that the Spirit's stirring us toward repentance. You know, and that's kind of an old word, but it simply means to turn around, to turn our hearts back toward God, back to our families, back uh, to loving one another. God has more for you than you know right now. I think he has more for me than I know right now. My main text today is going to be coming from 1 Peter, and we're going to start in chapter 1. So if you want to go ahead and... uh, and turn there, go ahead and get there, but, um, but that's where I'm going to start, and I'm going to move through the whole, the whole book, the whole letter. So, um, Jesus used parables to teach people, and uh, parables are not reality, they don't actually happen, but we can draw a lot of truth from them, and sometimes it, as we contemplate on them, more and more truth will come, and deeper meaning will come to us. And so as I was preparing my message, it's really strange because I I don't usually use uh, a parable of this culture. If I do, I tell one of Jesus's. But I felt like the Lord spoke to me a a parable. uh, Well, actually, it just came as like, I think it's maybe what you call maybe a little idiom, or it's just a little saying, but it's goody two-shoes. And I thought, Well, that's interesting, but then when I I dug down into it, what did it mean? I actually found that it originates from an old English parable in which they would tell children to kind of teach them principles and morality and things like that. But this is an 18th century children's story, Goody Two-Shoes. Goody Two-Shoes, I'm going to tell you the story because when I looked it up, I thought, okay, God's speaking and this is what he's saying. She was a poor orphan girl who owned only one shoe. When a rich benefactor gave her a new pair of shoes, so then she had two. She obsessively delighted in her brand new two shoes. And she told everyone about them and just delighted over and over about it, about this special gift that she loved so much. The phrase goody two shoes, uh, goody two shoes, let me get it right, developed uh, as a negative connotation. Because the girl subsequently married into money, which called into question her true character. So a blessing can bring out the worst, actually, in us. A gift can actually bring out the worst. And we're never satisfied, but maybe we only want more things. She got the two shoes after being just a poor orphan girl. And then her things meant so much to her. Materialism kind of just took over. And apparently... Goody two-shoes became another idiom, if you will, gold digger. That's what I thought of. A person who engages in a type of transactional relationship, a person maybe who marries for money rather than love. 
Now you can connect this however you want, but I, I, it made me immediately think of, of how we, we come into relationship with the Lord, you know, or the bride of Christ, you know, and a poor orphan with only one shoe. And, and then God blesses us with, with a gift, and, and then we become obsessed about the gifts, and we lose our passion for the one who loves us. So I don't know. You can think on this a little bit, but a goody two-shoes, given the opportunity, I believe that she would have been also maybe the teacher's pet. That's another one. The person who conforms to laws and keeps all the rules, does all the right things, but not out of really pure motives. If you've ever pe- know what the teacher's pet type person is like, they'll play up to the teacher and tattle on everyone else, right? And get them in trouble and make themselves look better. A biblical example, I believe, of a, of a, a teacher's pet or a, this type of person would be Matthew 19, the rich young ruler. The rich, rich young ruler approaches Jesus, who's with his disciples, and he comes up to him and addresses him as good teacher, asking, what must I do to inherit eternal life? And Jesus first asks, well, why do you call me good? Only God is good. Was the young man making a confession of faith in Jesus? I don't know. Then Jesus said something like this. If you want eternal life, then keep the commandments. And then the rich young ruler went on to confirm that he had done this, you know, that um, he had kept all these commandments and began to name them to Jesus. And I think he actually expected the good teacher, Jesus, to validate him and confirm, you know, that he was already good and he was ready. But instead, Jesus challenged him with the one thing he hadn't done, which was to give all of his wealth away to the poor and to follow him. And perhaps the rich young ruler had become a bit like Goody Two-Shoes. He had obtained blessing, and it spoiled his character. And Jesus went to the heart of the matter. The young man loved his material things, and those meant more to him than God. So Jesus actually, when I thought about it, and you think about it, Jesus is actually the the rich young ruler who came from heaven and gave up everything to sacrifice here. And he made a sacrificial love through the cross, right? He was the example of sacrificial love. God is good. God's goodness is revealed in Jesus' cross. And Jesus is the antithesis or the complete opposite of a goody two-shoes. He makes sacrifices for others, giving his life for us. The rich young ruler didn't want what God wanted for him. And God wants us to spiritually mature. He wants us to grow up. Your faith is worth more than gold. And it comes by sacrifice. The young man's true motivation was instantly exposed, right, in that moment. But only God knows your heart. He only, only God knows your true motives. And I think sometimes they're even veiled to us. Why we do the things that we do, uh, make the decisions that we make, even when we do good, you know? We're supposed to do good out of a pure heart, to do good out of a heart of love, and so that God can bless us. And I really do believe that God wants to bless us so that we can bless others. So my question today, and I love to start with a question so you can kind of contemplate it, because I think it's important to this message. What or who has hurt you? What's caused you grief? What's caused you suffering? And it may be something way back in your life. Maybe it happened decades ago when you were a child. Or maybe it's happened a few years ago. Or maybe it's happening right now. What are you going through right now then? But what is it? Think about those, those things or that thing that you are suffering with. I want you to know that suffering is universal. And Psalms 34, 18 says, the Lord is close to the brokenhearted. He rescues those whose spirits are crushed. On Calvary, when Jesus died, there were three crosses. And I never really thought about this before, but I believe those three crosses represent the universality of suffering. That suffering is universal. Think about it. The one cross had a repented thief on it. Another cross had an unrepentant thief on it, and then there was the righteous son of God. All three experienced the cross. All three suffered. And I think that those three crosses are telling us that. No one is going to get out of suffering. The sinner will suffer. The righteous will suffer. 
There's a com commonality of being human and suffering. It's the Christ cross, though, that unites us. We are united, actually, by the cross. As believers, we're united by that. Christ suffered and died for the whole world, and you and me. So my major point today, and I want you to get this, this phrase, and maybe it'll just kind of catch and you'll remember it, but no cross, no crown. No cross, no crown. Think about it. The cross is a symbol of suffering. It was the worst way to die. It was the worst thing that could happen to you in that time. And I think it actually would be the worst thing that could happen to you in this time. It's slow, it's painful, it's public, it's humiliating. The cross is a symbol, though, of victory in his glory. So it's both. It's a symbol of suffering and it's a symbol of victory. Without the cross, there could be no crown. So perhaps we should say it this way. The cross is both the sign of suffering and glory at the same time, which would mean our suffering also can bring God glory. Think about it. I'm telling you the truth. If Christ's suffering brought God's glory, then so does our suffering. Our suffering brings God glory. Maybe we need to quit trying to flee from the cross and instead love the cross Today's church desperately needs an understanding of suffering. I realized myself I had a very poor understanding of suffering. There's a great story I want to tell you about a man named D.L. Moody. And some of you may know his name. He was a great uh, evangelist and pastor back in the 1800s. D.L. Moody was sitting in a service listening to another man preach. And the man said these words, The world has yet to see what God can do with one man who is totally surrendered to God. And when that preacher said those words, D.L. Moody sat there and he thought in his heart, by God's grace, I will be that man. Following that, there were numerous fires. His, his church burned down the same week that his house burned down, right after saying this. And after that, he experienced numerous fires throughout, I believe, his ministry even. So, fact one, I want you to hear me, everybody will suffer. Fact two, God suffered. Fact three, suffering tests our hearts. And fact four, suffering purifies our hearts. Now back to my opening little parable about Goody Two-Shoes. I'm sure Goody Two-Shoes thought she had a pure heart, and so did everyone else. Apparently, she became a little prideful after she got those two shoes. And when God blesses you with something, it's easy to become full of yourself instead of full of gratitude. God doesn't waste anything bad that happens to us, and I know that. God perfects and prepares us through our troubles. And I honestly believe that God has really, really big plans for all of you. But God doesn't promote those who he doesn't first put through the fire. He, does, he tests us by fire. In 1 Peter, we're gonna start there with the scripture, and I'm gonna read a few of them, so if you've got your Bible, that's great. Get it out. But Peter encourages us in 1 Peter chapter 1, verse 6. He says these words, So be truly glad. There is wonderful joy ahead, even though you must endure many trials for a little while. These trials will show that your faith is genuine. It is being tested as fire test and purifies gold, though your faith is far more precious than mere gold. So when your faith remains strong through many trials, it will bring you much praise and glory and honor on the day when Jesus Christ is revealed to the whole world. There is only one thing that the enemy honestly wants to steal from you. I really believe this, because if he steals this from you, he's stolen everything. He wants to steal your faith. He's a thief and a liar, and he wants to steal your faith because your faith says, you know what? I trust God. I, I trust God. I trust in God's goodness. No matter what happens, no matter what goes wrong in my life, faith says, I trust God. And your faith will be tested because it's the most valuable thing that you have, and the enemy knows it. Do good. No matter what your circumstances, God wants you to do good. I think about, we've kind of had that slogan here in the church, so if, you, if you've attended here lately, we, we're trying to find ways to do good, even now with COVID-19, and we've done some things, and we're going to do more if this goes on, but um, do good is kind of maybe now our, our, our mission statement for us, do good, and under do good, I want you to think of, a, of what, what do good means. It means to love God and to love others. 
And that was what Jesus said was the greatest commandment, to love God and to love others. So even if you are treated wrongly and lied about, cheated, do good anyway. The phrase do good is used many times in the Bible. I was shocked when I looked it up, at least in the NLT version. So we're going to look at here uh, another scripture in 1 Peter chapter 2, verse 19 through 21. Starts like this. For God is pleased when conscious of his will, you patiently endure unjust treatment. Wait a minute. Patiently endure unjust treatment? Of course, you get no credit for being patient if you are beaten for doing wrong. But if you suffer for doing good and endure it patiently, God is pleased with you. Now, right there tells us that you can be doing right, you can be a righteous person and suffer. Verse 21, for God called you to do good even if it means suffering, just as Christ suffered for you. He is your example, and you must follow in his footsteps. I don't know where in the church in the last years or so, but I feel like this is not the message that, that we have heard. It's almost like we think if we do good that everything's going to go well for us, and we will never have to suffer because Jesus did that for us. But there seems to be... He was actually the example, and we're supposed to follow in his footsteps. And he showed us the way in which to do good, even when we're suffering. And it seems to imply that we will suffer. So no matter what, we're to do good. And I believe this. When there is no cross, there will be no crown. No suffering means no glory. But we have to suffer like Christ with no complaining. And here's the problem. When things start going wrong in our life, we tend to revert back like the Old Testament Israelites did coming out of Egypt. And we just complain and grumble and complain and grumble. We need to not complain and grumble because no cross, no crown, no suffering, no glory. It is the way that Jesus taught us. And I think we just need to wake up and realize it. And that's what God wants to say to you today. The cross serves us. It works humility in the believer's life. We are not naturally humble. We are like little Miss Goody Two-Shoes, right? The minute we get any little blessing or gift or something goes our way, pride can come right into our life and out the door goes humility. Psalms 30 30, verse 5 says, Weeping may last for the night, but joy comes in the morning. So sorrows, I actually believe, are written into everybody's story. It's written into your story. Sorrows are written into our stories. Sometimes we spend a season in what they call the dark night of the soul. The mystics call that. The cross is at work in this time, in those dark times. And God actually means it for good. He means it for your good. One day, God will say over your life after you have suffered, enough. And he will bring you into your destiny and what he has for you. No one's going to live a pain-free life. No one will get out of here even alive. Think about it. And let's go on with 1 Peter chapter 3, verse 13. Pick up there. Now, who will want to harm you if you are eager to do good? But even if you suffer for doing what is right, God will reward you for it. So don't worry or be afraid of their threats. So we actually are rewarded for suffering. God rewards suffering. And yet as believers and Christians, it seems like we're just trying to flee from the cross. But God wants to reward you for going through things without complaining and going through them the right way. Remember, verse 17, remember it is better to suffer for doing good if that is what God wants than to suffer for doing wrong. Christ, or, Christ suffered for our sins once for all time. He never sinned, but he died for sinners to bring you safely home to God. He suffered physical death, but he was raised to life in the spirit. Now, it's pretty clear that Jesus suffered. So God suffered. We can say that God suffered. And part of God's plan has to do with incorporating suffering and bringing good through suffering. Because suffering is part of being human. God uses it. Humility is the way of Jesus. Before the crown, there is always the cross. A cross then at that time was a form of punishment. Like I said, the most humiliating way to die, hanging, naked, bleeding, and dying with spectators jeering at you. And yet Jesus was innocent, humiliated, degraded, hurt, false, 
falsely accused, unjustly treated, and he said nothing. He took it. And so are we to do the same way. It was clearly part of God's plan to suffer. He came to earth actually to suffer. His great plan to free humanity comes through his own death, his own suffering. In 1 Peter chapter 4, let's read again at verse 1. So then, since Christ suffered physical pain, you must arm yourselves with the same attitude that he had. What's your attitude? Come on. The same attitude that he had. And be ready to suffer too. We're supposed to be ready to suffer. We're supposed to be expecting to suffer. For if you have suffered physically for Christ, you have finished with sin. Now, this is, what, this is how suffering works. When we actually suffer, it makes us be done with sin. You won't spend the rest of your lives chasing your own desires. It gets rid of those. But you will be anxious to do the will of God. You have had enough in the past of evil things that godless people enjoy. Their immorality and their lust, their feasting and their drunkenness and their wild parties and their terrible worship of idols. You know, when I, when I read about idols, you know, in the, the New Testament, you would think, oh, well, we don't worship idols, you know. But yes, we do. Our idolatry looks like us obsessing and loving materialistic things. You know, uh, being obsessed with uh, the things in the world. Being obsessed by the blessings of God. You know, uh, caring more about what we can get in the relationship with God than actually loving God. And that is idolatry. And then First Peter chapter 4, 4 uh, verse 12 says this. Dear friends, don't be surprised at the fiery trials you're going through. As if something strange were happening to you. Instead, be very glad, for these trials make you partners with Christ in his sufferings. Wait, wait, there's, some, there's a strange partner, there's a mystery here. How we're like connected and joined with Christ. He makes you partner, fiery trials, like they, they make you partners with Christ in his suffering. You're united with him in some way. So that you will have a wonderful joy of seeing his glory when it is revealed to all the world. Verse 15, if you suffer, however, it must not be for murder, stealing, making trouble, or prying into other people's affairs. If you suffer, it has to actually be for righteousness. And then we're partnered with Christ in that. There's a solidarity in suffering. There's a fellowship of suffering between believers, but also with Christ. The camaraderie with those that have also suffered in similar ways that you've suffered. You will find this to be true. Now when I meet someone who has lost a child, there's a strange bond that you can't explain. When you, when you find someone who has gone through the fiery trial that you have gone through, there's a, a connection, a, a spiritual bond. Through our own suffering, we have a special connection and bond also with Christ because he suffers with you when you suffer. 1 Peter 4.12, remember said, these fiery trials will make you partners with Christ in his suffering, in his suffering. So you're suffering in partners with, like, you don't, I, I believe that Christ is with you in it. Like, it's, it's like there's, there's a mystery here. Unfortunately, I believe, like, the charismatic roots that so many of us in, in the church today, spirit-filled believers, we have taught against suffering. As if if you suffer, the only reason, the, the, the only reason that you could suffer is for doing wrong. But it's actually not true. You actually do suffer for righteousness if we look at even the life of Christ. I don't know how we could have missed that so, and gotten that so wrong. Now, while I believe like charismatics have, have an energy and exhibit a great exuberance, right, when they worship, there's a, just a shallowness of understanding how that suffering matures your faith and how necessary it is that we go through trials in which we suffer, but we mature through them. We all got so focused on the gifts of the Spirit and the power of God working in and through us, but we had no understanding of his cross working in us. I'm going to read you something, I, a book that I've been reading, Suffering in the Heart of God by Diane Langberg. It's an incredible quote. Just listen to this. As we enter into suffering, our own or another's, seeking him in the dark places of our lives, the glory comes. 
It is not from the end of suffering or its effects, but from little by little being transformed into this image as we suffer. We begin to wear his patience, his grace, his love, and his kindness into suffering, even while joining in his scream. What an incredible quote to help us understand uh, suffering. There's another great quote, and I really think it's worth reading. Listen to this. She says this, you and I would rather be familiar with success. He was despised and rejected. We prefer acceptance and applause. He took up our griefs and carried our sorrows. We desire to take up awards and carry accolades. He was crushed for our sins, oppressed, judged, and cut off from the land of the living. The contrast of what we want in even Christians in America and what we, what we pursue from who Christ actually showed us we were to look like and we were to be is so different. So goody two-shoes is actually an expression of disapproval because blessings can lead our hearts astray into materialism and into many things. When hidden motives in our heart is not, when the hidden motives in our heart that's not to love and please God. Our motive needs to be to love and please God. All the good that we do out of impure motives are just appearance. And just for appearance, we are not really good or really mature. We just want to give off the appearance of goodness. God really wants us to be good. Even doing good can have a fleshly motives and have self-promotion or self-interest behind it like the rich young ruler. You don't even know what's in your heart. We all assume that our hearts are good, but God really knows what's in our heart. God desires to make us like Jesus. His image is one of goodness. And we see what's in our heart when we're really in a fiery trial because it comes out. So true love for God and others comes by the way of the cross, comes by the fire, and comes by suffering. After the rich young ruler leaves Jesus and the disciples have a private discussion amongst themselves in Matthew 19, verse 27, Peter says, we've given up everything to follow you. He says to Jesus, what will we get? And then Jesus replies to him in verse 29, he said, and everyone who has given up houses or brothers or sisters or fathers or mother or children or property for my sake will receive a hundred times as much in return and will inherit eternal life. But many who are the greatest now will be the least important then. And those who seem least important now will be the greatest then. These are the words of Jesus. So there are trials and there are things that your houses are going to burn down and are things that, you know, with D.L. Moody, that you saw the fiery trials and this continual burning down. So there are trials and tests of things that you're going to lose. There's going to be losses along the way. But Jesus is saying that there will also be reward. You will receive a hundred times your return and inherit eternal lives. So if we don't want suffering and we don't want loss, this doesn't happen. So who's the greatest? In the next reality, undoubtedly, will be those who have suffered and had some crosses and to bear and some losses and some suffering and had some fiery trials that tested their faith. We're to love the cross. The mystics of the early centuries teach us if you love Jesus, you must learn to love the cross. We need to quit fleeing from the cross. We've been a people who've ran from hardships and losses and troubles and trials. But the saints believe the soul must journey through suffering to go higher, further, deep, and deeper spiritually. They knew such sufferings as nights, as darkness, unknowing, spiritual trials, or even doubt. Diane Langberg, globally recognized for her work with trauma victims, wrote, In suffering, you can divide people into two categories, those that flee and those who stay. And those that stay and will cling to the cross, they will also weep with those who are weeping. The fleers are avoiders. Every opportunity, embrace the cross, love the cross. It's the purifying your hearts, bringing the cross Bearing the cross in our life forges a Christian maturity in us. And Richard Rohr wrote these words. 
The genius of Jesus' teaching is that it reveals that God uses tragedy, suffering, pain, betrayal, and death itself, not to wound us, in fact, to bring us into a larger identity. Remember in John 12, 24, unless the single grain of wheat loses its shell, it remains just a single grain. So no cross, no crown. Jesus said, actually, remember, take up your cross and follow me. What if you made it to heaven without suffering, without a cross to bear? I'm not sure it's even possible. You would have gone through no test. You would have refused the cross. So my beginning question, my opening question as the band comes was this. What or who has hurt you? What caused your grief? What caused you to suffer? They're all opportunities. And then God's hand will work in you as you accept them as God's hand. And Peter gave this closing advice in his book in 1 Peter chapter 5, verse 5 through 10. He said, God opposes the proud but gives grace to the humble. So humble yourselves under the mighty power of God and at the right time he will lift you up in honor. Give all your worries and cares to God, for he cares about you. Stay alert. Watch out for your great enemy, the devil. He prowls around like a roaring lion looking for someone to devour. Stand firm against him and be strong in your faith. Remember that your family of believers all over the world is going through the same kind of suffering you are. Isn't that so true for right now? In the verse 10, he closes with this. In his kindness, God called you to share in his eternal glory by means of Christ Jesus. So after you have suffered a little while, he will restore, support, and strengthen you. And he will place you on a firm foundation. You took all our shame, left it in the grave. We're forgiven, we're forgiven. The work forever done, only by the blood. It is finished, it is finished. Oh, you took all our shame, left it. I believe the Lord wants us just to pray together right now. So right in your homes where you're at, I just want to take a moment. Let's just stay focused just for the next few minutes. I really feel like that God is calling us to a place of realigning our lives with him during this season. So Lord, right now, we come to you with a repentant heart. We're truly sorry, God. We're sorry for taking up grudges and being vindictive toward people that have hurt us being angry and hanging on to things, Lord, because we've been betrayed and we've been hurt and we've been treated unjustly. But Lord, now, today we realize that it's the cross, it's the suffering, and it is the way to glory, Lord. That God, that we were also called to, to suffer the things that people would do to us, the, the injustice that would come our way. But God, because we've taken up offense at them, Lord. We need to repent, Lord God. 
And so, God, I'm very sorry, Lord, because that's not your way to take up offense. So, Lord, forgive us. Forgive us for, for being offended and, and holding on to hurt. Lord, we release the hurt today to you, and we let it go. We embrace the cross. We love you, Jesus, and we also love your cross because it was through the cross and through your suffering that we were set free. And we were released from the bonds and the chains of sin and even, even the bondage that other people put on us, God. We were released from it through your cross, through your forgiveness, Lord. So because you forgave us, we choose to forgive others today. So release us, Lord Jesus. Do the work of forgiveness. The cross, Lord, I thank you, that does the work of forgiveness in our lives, Lord. Some of the offenses against our life was so great that we're not even capable within ourselves to do it. All we can do is bring the hurt and pain and lay it at your feet and say, Jesus, I want to forgive and I want to let this go. So work it. Let your cross work in me. Let your cross do this work in me that I could be set free from the past. Thank you, Jesus. I receive that today. By faith, I believe that your cross was enough and it does this work in my life. Thank you, Lord. Well, I'm just believing that this is going to be an incredible week for you. I want you to take time to spend with the Lord and, and, and just ask him, God, what are you doing in my life? What good gift have I not been ready to receive? God, I want to be able to receive it. I want to be prepared for more. I'm not going to run from the cross anymore. And when someone hurts me, I'm just going to see it as the cross working in my life. And I'm going to let humility come in my life. And I'm going to humble myself and not respond angrily anymore, you know. So let this week be a new week for you. If you catch yourself going back to your old ways, just say, oh, God, forgive me. And get back up and go with him again. And you can. It's just that easy. Just ask for his forgiveness and get back up and go. And keep going and keep following Jesus. And love him with all your heart. Let's not love him for what we can get. For the good gifts that he gives us. But let's just love him because he's Jesus. He gave everything for us. He's truly good. Amen. Amen.